Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Ask the Doctor webinar. My name is Shelly Korean with SkyPass Foundation. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday weekend. I see a lot of familiar names on our attendee list. So welcome back to our regular attendees. And for those of you who are new here, welcome for the first time. We are so glad you were joining us tonight. We are a nonprofit based in Dallas, Texas, and we specialize in serving the Parkinson's community. And this Ask the Doctor webinar is an interview style, monthly educational series covering PD related topics. And tonight our topic of discussion is deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, otherwise known as DBS. We have an expert on this topic joining us for tonight. It's my honor to welcome Dr. Nader Paratian from UT Southwestern, who will be interviewed on this topic by Dr. Ch Shilpa Chitnis, who's also from UTSW, and uh, Dr. Chitnis also serves on the board of directors here at SkyPass Foundation. Just a quick intro on Dr. Paratian before we get started. Dr. Pratian serves as professor and chair of neurological surgery at UT Southwestern Medical Center. He brings extensive clinical expertise in the surgical management of movement disorders, psychiatric disease, and facial pain syndromes using brain stimulation, targeted ablation, radiosurgery, and microsurgical techniques. His research aims to understand brain diseases and to develop targeted therapy. Dr. Pratian is passionate about education in neurosurgery, neuroscience, and bioengineering, having mentored countless neurosurgical trainees, undergraduate and graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and junior faculty. Dr. Pratian, thank you for taking the time to be here. We are all very excited to hear from you, and we've received some great questions with registration that you guys submitted. So if you're joining us live, Feel free to submit your questions. If you didn't submit them with registration, you can use the QA box or the chat box at the bottom of your screen and Shilpa and myself will be monitoring those questions and we will address those towards the end of our time together. And with that, I will hand it over to my very able co-host, Dr. Shilpa Chitnis for the interview. Uh, thank you, Shelly, and a warm welcome to Dr. Pratian. And so we will um, track try to explore various aspects of deep brain stimulation. So I'll really start out with a very simple question. Uh, what is deep brain stimulation? So it's a great question to start with. And, and actually, let me start by saying thank you for the opportunity to um, speak with uh, all of you who are attending today. It's a great turnout. Uh, it's hard to understand or explain what deep brain stimulation is to someone who's not familiar with it. And so I often will draw an analogy to something that people do know very well, which is a cardiac pacemaker. And that's actually where deep brain stimulation technology came out of. And everyone knows that um, a cardiac pacemaker is something that can be prescribed or recommended when someone has an abnormal rhythm and you know consists of a battery and wires that go to the heart and it sends electrical impulses to the heart to uh, maintain a more normal rhythm. And deep brain stimulation is not too different from that, except that uh, instead of the wires going from uh, the battery to the heart, it goes into the brain. And we call it deep brain stimulation because the targets we use are, are deep within the brain. And uh, again, just like a pacemaker, it sends electrical impulses uh, to the brain in order to uh, try and restore a more normal pattern of activity um, and then improve the symptoms for patients. So it's, it's, it's a brain simulator, just like a cardiac pacemaker is. Yeah, wonderful. And when uh, was it approved in the United States? So uh, originally deep brain simulation was approved in the late 90s, I believe in 1997 for a tremor uh, in a, the, a, for a central tremor, not for a tremor related to Parkinson's disease. And then it was in the early 2000s that deep brain simulation uh, received FDA approval for Parkinson's disease. So we often like to talk about it as a new and advanced therapy, but we've actually have multiple decades of experience with it and uh, perfecting the techniques and really having a good idea of which benefit, which patients to treat with this type of therapy. Yeah. Um, and if you can tell our audience as to how does deep brain stimulation actually really work within the brain? It's a good question. And I, I might kick that right back to you in a second, because we don't actually know how deep brain stimulation works. I'll tell you a little bit about how 
Um, it was conceptualized. And then uh, very briefly about some of the research that's being done. Um, but, you, you know, it, it used to be that before we did brain stimulation, uh, surgeons would actually put a probe in the brain and burn a part of the brain. And that would provide relief of certain symptoms, including for Parkinson's disease. Uh, and it was uh, in France that, that the modern era of deep brain stimulation came to be. And the thought was that brain stimulation would basically jam the circuits. And by delivering a lot of electricity to that part of the brain, it would cause a temporary lesion, that it would interrupt the electrical activity and therefore um, block that part of the brain. Now we think of it slightly differently, and uh, that's why I use the analogy of the cardiac pacemaker. And uh, you know, just like the heart has rhythms and it could have an arrhythmia or an abnormal rhythm, we, we're learning more and more that the brain has abnormal rhythms as well, just like you can see on the EEG, but you can record directly from in, within the brain. And we think the brain stimulation restores a more normal pattern of uh, brain rhythms and, and that's related to improvement in symptoms. Yeah, very much so. Um, and so what conditions is the uh, deep brain stimulation approved for currently? So for a long time, that was a very limited answer, uh, although it's expanded recently. Um, as I mentioned before, the um, very first approval was for essential tremor, which is a movement disorder, actually much more common than Parkinson's disease, but distinct from Parkinson's disease. It's also approved for Parkinson's disease, and those have full FDA approval. Uh, there was a uh, subsequent approval for dystonia, which is another movement disorder, although I won't get into details, but a slightly different type of approval from the um, FDA, but still enables surgeons to deliver the therapy. Subsequent to that, we got uh, approval for obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, again, with that limited type of approval. And finally, the most recent one, uh, if I'm not forgetting anything, is for uh, epilepsy, which has received a full approval from the FDA. So really five diagnoses, essential tremor, Parkinson's disease, dystonia, obsessive compulsive disorder, and most recently, epilepsy. Yeah, wonderful. So we'll try to zero down and focus more on Parkinson's disease today. And so the question is that, is everybody with Parkinson's disease just automatically a candidate? And if no, then who is a good candidate for DBS? It's a, a fantastic question. Um, and uh, the short answer is, uh, it, might, it might depend on who you speak to, but I think the most common uh, belief is that not everyone is a candidate for deep brain stimulation surgery. And it's not even to say that at some point, uh, it, it's not even true that every patient at some point will be a candidate because some people will argue that. Um, so it's definitely true that not everyone is currently a candidate. And I think it's even not true that not every patient will be a candidate at some point. Meaning um, there are patients, maybe I'll go to this fact, every patient with Parkinson's disease is different. There's a different combination of symptoms. There's a different pattern of progression. There's a different response to medication. And there's a different progression of how people respond to the medications. And so it's hard to, uh, for me to say that everyone is a candidate for deep brain stimulation. The people, um, and there's a, a couple different groups of patients that we consider for deep brain stimulation. And it's primarily people who have disabling symptoms from motor symptoms. As we know, Parkinson's disease has many symptoms beyond the motor symptoms. Um, and it's for people who have, first and foremost, a good response to Parkinson's medications, really carbidopa, levodopa. Uh, you know, if you have a good response, but you know, maybe your response is inconsistent, or maybe when you take the medications, you get too much dyskinesia, so those excess movements that could be associated with Parkinson's disease. Or maybe the dose wears off too quickly, so you get a good response, but then you have uh, rapid wearing off or unpredictable wearing off. It's those patients, again, who respond well to the medications, but the medications are somewhat erratic in how they treat the symptoms. And so what I'll tell people is, you know, if you have a really good response to carbidopa, levodopa, 
and you feel like your life would be significantly better if you could have more time in that best on condition, then deep brain stimulation is probably uh, a consideration for you, assuming you don't have other disabling symptoms. There's one, there's two groups that I'll, I'll mention uh, as an aside. The one motor symptom of Parkinson's disease that may not respond to medications, but will respond to deep brain stimulation is tremor. Um, and tremor is variable. Sometimes it responds to medications, sometimes it doesn't, but there are patients with tremor dominant disease who don't get better with medications, who will get better with stimulation. So that's one group. And then there's a very rare group, although it's definitely a, a group that we treat, who are patients who are just intolerant <laughs> of the medications due to severe side effects. And so we consider surgery earlier on because we just can't get them therapeutic on medications. So it's a, it's a mix of symptoms and a mix of patients. But to answer your first question, to come full circle, it's definitely not every patient who should be treated with deep brain stimulation. Yes, I think this is a really good answer. Uh, so just to follow up with that, which patient with Parkinson's disease is definitely not a candidate? Oh, that's a, that's a difficult one because I think there's a, a, a couple. I think that the ones we think of the most are, um, well, two. Um, I think if, if we can't see a definitive response to carbidopa levodopa, you know, people who say it just doesn't work well enough and I need something better, that's a red flag for us because it makes us really think about whether the diagnosis is even correct. Because as you may know, uh, there are patients who have Parkinsonian symptoms but may not have Parkinson's disease. I think the other group that we think of that we really don't want to implant are patients who have significant cognitive uh, effects of Parkinson's disease. And the reason for that is uh, we find that patients who develop uh, really cognitive deficiencies related to Parkinson's disease, significant ones, much of their disability is related to that or the cognitive impairments. And making them better from a motor perspective doesn't improve their overall quality of life. So we're really looking at the whole patient, what all their symptoms are, and wanting to make sure that they can say that the symptoms that we can treat with Parkinson's disease will make their life better. And if they can't say that, then we don't want to implant them. Yeah, definitely. How about patients that you know, we know have had Parkinson's disease, but are really having a lot of falls? Like, do you consider those people or is it too late? Uh, so that's a, a good question. I think those are people who, in general, we hesitate to implant. Uh, because deep brain stimulation will um, increase, uh, will, will often increase the rate of falls, often because people are, we think because people are getting up and moving around a bit more. Uh, but maybe to reframe your question, another group of patients that we often hesitate to treat are people who have significant gait or walking dysfunction or significant falls because those are symptoms that are not going to get better with stimulation either, just like they usually don't get better with medications. Um, and so uh, I would say in general, we, we tend to not implant those patients unless we can somehow find an ex a reason why the other motor symptoms are more disabling and that it's worth considering. But that would be on a very rare uh, occasion, a you know, case by case basis. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I remember uh, just very many, long time ago with this patient that was having a lot of falls, but really was so um, uh, stiff and so slow in the off state and very dyskinetic in the on state. And we literally did DBS for compassionate, you know, purposes to help the patient, but to also help the family to be able to take care of the patient. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and I think that's the main thing. It's it's really tough when we do these interviews, as you know, Dr. Chitness, to you know really draw strict categories and lines about who we implant and who we don't. It's really the, the bigger picture of what this patient is going through, what are the symptoms that are disabling, and if we make those symptoms better, what symptoms will still remain and what will their quality of life be? And trying to figure out that calculation for each patient independently. No, uh, absolutely. And the thing is that, you know, when you 
read the literature and we talk about candidate selection, you know, especially in clinical trials, you have to be like very stringent. But when we are taking care of patients, as you said, we're just trying to help. And so we may not always pick like the top best candidate, you know, or, or candidates that would have not entered the clinical trial, but we're just trying to improve quality of life for patients as right. much as we can. So that's a really good uh, way to look at it. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the, uh, you know, the candidate selection process and the steps that are involved. Let's say a general neurologist uh, from the community refers a patient to you, or even the, you know, movement disorder colleagues in, in our section refer to you. What kind of process have, you know, uh, you and our team, can you tell the audience about you know, the unique uh, neuromodulation dual clinic that we are in the process of developing now, uh, which will, uh, you know, hope to make things easier for patients. Yeah, so uh, it's a very comprehensive process uh, because it's not a quick fix surgery. Um, and as we've already talked about, there are so many things that we need to consider. Uh, and in my mind, even though patients get referred with a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, and as I said, I treat other diagnoses as well, the first and foremost thing is to evaluate and confirm the diagnosis. And that is why um, I work so closely with our neurology colleagues, including Dr. Chitnis and others, uh, to make sure that the patient has been evaluated and been uh, managed by someone who really knows a lot about uh, managing Parkinson's disease. There are some excellent uh, general neurologists who manage Parkinson's disease extremely well, but when you're getting to the point of considering deep brain stimulation, that means you have pretty advanced disease and you need someone who has a lot of experience uh, managing the medications and knowing how to refine the medication. So I think having a movement disorders neurologist is, is key uh, to uh, ensuring the diagnosis, as well as making sure that medical management has been optimized as much as possible. Uh, you know, as uh, you mentioned, we, we do have a joint clinic. I, I do believe strongly that we, we should be, our care should be revolving around our patients, uh, not that the patients should be revolving around us. So uh, we come together and we evaluate patients together in clinic so that, you know, you get to evaluate, or neurology gets to evaluate the patient, um, and you know we get to talk about the, see the patient together, talk about the patient directly, have that real uh, human to human, doctor to doctor interaction, which is so much better than just communicating on paper, because we get to talk about the subtleties and and what um, what our concerns are, and and talk through um, all of those uh, challenges uh, in real time, and be able to deliver the correct message to the patient about what to do. And, you know, I think that's the initial part. And it, as I've often said, you know, there are about 80% of patients, it's either clear that they should not have surgery because their goals are not consistent with what we can do, or it's very clear that they're a candidate for surgery. But there are, you know, a good number of 20 to 30% of patients who um, we still have some additional questions. And um, so we do get subsequent testing, um, neuropsychological testing to affect, to see what the impact of Parkinson's disease is on cognition. Um, if appropriate and if needed, um, we, we might get a physical therapy assessment to uh, see um, other therapeutic needs of the patient. Um, and the last, and you know, we have to get a brain MRI. So that's another part of the preparation. The last thing I forgot to mention, which is an important part of the neurological evaluation, is, is really seeing patients in an off condition and an on condition, seeing that response to carbidopa, levodopa, so that we can, again, predict or have a, have a sense of how to counsel the patient about what to expect from the surgery. I think I, I got all that. The, the, so it's, it's a lot, it's a big process. I, I, tell, I tell my patients, you're, you're, you're basically marrying into the family because once you get a deep brain stimulator, <laughs> You're, you're with us and, and we take care of you. And so we want to make sure that we, we understand you, we can counsel you correctly and that um, you know what to expect. Absolutely. And just, just for our patients to know, how long do you think uh, approximately it would take from the time that a patient is referred until the, the you know, time that they are implanted? 
Um, we're still working that out. Uh, so uh, in general, I would say it's probably on the order of, you know, from, from the time that you see us in clinic to getting surgery is probably on the order of two to three months if everything goes smoothly. Um, although, you know, because of our comprehensive evaluation, it might take a, a little while to get into clinic as well because it's coordinating two of our schedules. Um, so it might take a couple months on that side as well. So uh, two to three, uh, up to two to three months to get in and see us and then uh, two to three months uh, to get the surgery done. Um, and maybe I could sneak ahead. I don't know if you're gonna ask this question, but it's an important one, is you know, patients get very worried that they are going to run out of time and that time is of the essence. In truth, most people thinking about deep brain stimulation, it takes them a couple of years to even come to see us because uh, there's so much anxiety about the idea of brain surgery. And I get it. Um, but you're not really running out of time. There isn't a, a closing window um, where, you know, once you get to a certain age or once you've had disease for a certain number of years, you're no longer a candidate. It's more of a holistic impression of where you're at with your disease, what your symptoms are, can we help you? Uh, so that in related to that, again, you might be asking this later, but I'll skip ahead if, if that's the case. Um, the, the, the stimulation, it's, it's a symptomatic treatment. We're not changing the disease. So it's not like getting the surgery sooner is going to change the course of your disease and that you've got to rush in and do it. Um, if we turn the stimulator off, you're going to be exactly where you started. So um, really doing it right is more important than doing it fast. Although obviously we do want to take care of you as expeditiously as possible. No, absolutely. And if I can add just a few things that... Um, you know, in all humility, being a movement disorder neurologist that's trained in candidate selection. Now, if I get a patient that I am taking care of, and so I will definitely start looking at that patient as a candidate. You know, the minute somebody starts to develop dyskinesias or a little bit of wearing off in between dosages, my radar, you know, goes up to at least start thinking about DBS. I think uh, it is our goal with myself and Dr. Parati and to also educate the general neurology community uh, to be able to identify these patients, you know, at, at an appropriate time in their journey. And I think that's, you know, that's really uh, critical, I think. Um, it, it takes time. It, it takes, it's, a, it's not an overnight quick, it, it's, when we get an urgent referral for DBS, it's a little bit concerning that the expectations are not in the right place yet. So it's important for us to slow down. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then do you believe in the, you know, the data with early stimulation? Like, is, is that something that you believe in? And do you think that that is going to help? Uh, is that going to result in better quality of life if you do the surgery earlier rather than later? So I'm not, um, it's a good question. There's a lot of interest in early STEM and early STEM actually refers to almost, has different references. Uh, you know, there's, there's even some studies driven out of a, the group from Vanderbilt, as you know, uh, that's interested in doing deep brain stimulation, you know, early on in diagnosis within the first couple of years before you develop a lot of the symptoms that we're talking about. Yeah. There is not a lot of great data to support that, that there's an advantage. I don't think that they've shown that it's harmful. Uh, but we just don't know that it, there's an advantage yet. And they are, they're planning a large study to try and address that, although they've been planning that for many years and it's been hard to um, move that trial forward. Um, but you know, I'll, I'll also say that I've treated patients within a couple of years of their diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, even though I, I can't remember exactly what the FDA labeling is in terms of how long people have to have disease. I think it's four years. Four years, yes. Um, I guess I do remember, but <laughs> uh, but yes, for is. me that the, those years, it's just it's somewhat irrelevant. I, I treat the patient and their symptoms and where they're at. Some people just for one reason or another rapidly progress and become fluctuators and and have an inconsistent response, and that could be within three years of diagnosis. And if that's the case, I'm going to treat you. I'm not going to wait for the four year time, um, but. I, I just, when I talk about that, I also want to highlight that, you know, there are patients who have Parkinson's disease that I never see that have a diagnosis for 15 years or more who are managed very effectively on medications and, and do well um, or, or do well enough and never need to have surgery. So that it's every patient is different. Yeah, absolutely. And as uh, you know, myself as a neurologist, I really want 
the, the reason I like that window is because, you know, once we, people start to develop non-motor symptoms, then those things definitely start to impact, you know, quality of life. So although you may have the best implant, best programming, but the quality of life may not uh, improve if they have a lot of non-motor symptoms. So that's also one uh, thing to consider. And also, if I may say, the, the reason for four years or even five years is really sometimes, you know, people with Parkinson's disease can evolve into atypical uh, forms of Parkinsonism, especially there is one condition called MSC or multiple system atrophy that really mimics uh, idiopathic Parkinson's disease and responds to levodopa quite early in the disease, but then the response kind of, you know, starts to wear off. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great point. And that's why I work with neurologists because um, I think, uh, you know, I've been doing this for many years, so I'm, I'm pretty good at picking up Parkinson's disease and, and not Parkinson's disease, but the, the people who are very early on and we're thinking about stimulation, it's even more important. It's always important, but it's even more important to include a movement disorder neurologist to make sure that we're not missing any red flags or that something else isn't going on. Uh, because we really don't wanna treat the non-Parkinson's disease patients because they're not gonna really derive a benefit from stimulation. Absolutely. So let's switch gears a little bit, uh, Dr. Pradhan. Let's talk about the actual surgical process. What can you tell our patients and families about just quickly about the surgical process itself? So, you know, besides, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about what we need to do before the day of the surgery, uh, which is all the testing and the MRI. You know, we use the MRI before the day of the surgery or before the surgery to plan out uh, precisely where we place the electrodes for each patient. So your MRI becomes my roadmap to your brain. On the day of the surgery, our goal is to get the electrode in the right spot. And there are now many different ways to do this. Um, and the most traditional, the most, the way that we have the most experience with doing it is with uh, something called the stereotactic frame, which if you've looked on YouTube, it's, a, it's like almost like a box that gets fixed to your skull. Um, it, it does look archaic. It's been around for multiple decades, but it works extremely well. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of experience with applying that frame, but that holds your head still. It also gives us a coordinate system or basically maps out where your brain is relative to the frame so that we can put the electrode in your brain. There are other ways of knowing where your head is uh, using what, what's called frameless or mini frame systems. Uh, which are, you know, lots of studies showing that those are probably, uh, not probably, are, are equally as good. I don't think one is better than the other. What's best is to uh, let your surgeon do the way that they have the most experience with, because what they have the most experience with is where they're going to be most accurate, uh, most precise, and get the best outcome. So um, you, you want your surgeon to do it the way that they uh, know how to do it in terms of the frame placement. And then in terms of in the operating room, so we, we can plan, we can know where we want to put the electrodes. Um, again, the most traditional way of, of confirming that we're in the right spot is to do some recording. So we record from the brain as we pass the electrode in to uh, know that uh, we're hearing the firing pattern of the individual cells in the, in the target that we're uh, putting the electrode in. Um, and then we will turn the stimulator on and we look for the benefits from the stimulation right there in the operating room, which means the patient is awake. Um, and we're looking both for therapeutic benefits, we're also looking for side effects uh, on purpose because we know what structures are near our targets and we wanna know how far away we are, how much of a window we have for our neurologists like Dr. Chitnis to program the patient post-operatively so we can get the maximum benefit. There are other ways that have more recently uh, evolved and uh, less studied, less experienced, looking like it's probably as good, although um, not studied in the same way as what I've just described for you, which is to do it with a sleep implantation, which means under a general anesthetic, using either an MRI to guide the implantation or using um, a CT scan to confirm that the electrode is in the right spot. I think there's uh, experience mounting with that. I'm comfortable doing it. We do it for some patients. Um, you know, if a patient has extreme anxiety, then we're more than happy to do it uh, one way or the other, just working with the patient to get it done. But so it's really a matter of planning and then confirmation 
And um, we do the brain surgery on one day, we leave the electrodes under the skin. Then we have a separate small surgery about one hour long. That's when we put the generator in the chest and connect everything up before you follow up with neurology for the programming. Yeah, very good. And so um, can you tell us about some potential complications of deviant surgery? Sure. Uh, so the, the, you know, we've told you what to expect from the surgery, uh, which is, you know, more on time. Um, and this isn't really a complication, but it's, it's an important part of the expectations. It's not going to be perfect. So it's not that you get the surgery and I cringe when people say it's going to make my Parkinson's disease go away, or it's going to reverse my disease five years, because I don't think those are accurate representations. I think um, you know, some people might consider this not a good outcome, but you're still going to have dyskinesias a little bit. You'll still have dystonias a little bit. You'll still have off times a little bit, but you'll have far fewer hours in the day without those symptoms. So if you consider that not a good outcome, it's something important to know about. It's, it's not perfect, but it's really, really good. Um, but other complications, you know, operating on the brain, everyone's concerned about bleeding in the brain or having a stroke. It's about a 1% risk, one in a hundred chance of having a stroke. And it could be any array of symptoms. It could be cognitive changes. It could be weakness. It could be problems with walking or speech difficulties. Um, usually mild, usually not disabling, but it can be. The chance of bleed, of dying or you know, mortality is extremely low. I've never seen someone die from a surgery like this, but any surgery, there's, there is that risk. The other risk that we're actually more concerned about is infection. We're putting a foreign body in your brain and um, it, it's bacteria like to live on those things. And uh, in general, infection rates are probably somewhere around 4%. In large studies, they're up to 8 to 10%, actually. Um, I think most institutional series are somewhere around 3 to 4%, which is uh, where things are at for us as well. Just have to be extremely careful. We hate infections. We don't like to get them. It's not the end of the road, but it is a big bump in the road. And uh, it usually does require a partial explant. Uh, and then we can put the device in after an infection is treated. Other, you know, other things, there's a small risk of seizures just for the first day after the surgery. Um, medical complications, you know, if you're older, there's a risk of heart attack, of blood clots in the legs or lungs, um, other, you know, medical complications. And, uh, you know, devices, the, with the new devices, the, you know, there's three companies uh, approved in the United States. They're all really good. Um, I think what we used to see in terms of uh, device-related complications are probably going to be fewer and fewer. Uh, which is good, uh, but still, you know, batteries will run out. You need to get the batteries replaced unless you have a rechargeable system. Um, and then the stimulation can cause side effects. So sometimes, you know, our whole goal of stimulation is to make you better, but the stimulation itself could cause personality changes, speech changes, uh, motor responses. If those are seen, the nice thing about stimulation is we can turn it off, we can turn it down, we can change the direction of the stimulation, we can try and reduce those side effects, especially with the the newer technologies that are out these days. Yes, absolutely. And you know, one question that patients always ask me is, how can you be sure, Dr. Chenas, that the wires are going to land in the you know, right spot? Of course, if somebody has experienced it, you, that's not a problem, but what special measures you take to ensure that the wire is in the right spot? Oh, so, so many things. It's, it's the whole surgical process that is, you know, it's very, um, well planned. We're, we're, you know, as a surgeon, we're always thinking about what can go wrong, um, and we're avoiding those things that could go wrong. Uh, it's the con the confirmation during the surgery. It's also, you know, I, I told you about everything that happens in the surgery, uh, but it's a, it's a long term learning process too. So we're we're making sure we do the right thing for each patient, but we're also learning through you know communication with the team. And again, this is why having a team approach is so important because, you know, I, you know, look forward to getting feedback from neurologists like yourself about what is going on and, and how we, how the implant uh, is helping patients. And maybe one other thing to, to comment on is, you know, with the newer technologies, they have, there's this ability to, to shoot the electricity in one direction or another. And so we want to get it in the best spot possible, but we can compensate to some extent with these newer technologies that allow 
refinement in our stimulation pattern, which you know is really up to the neurologist like you uh, to help refine. Yes, absolutely. And uh, while we're talking about devices, uh, can you tell us uh, just a little bit, a snapshot of the devices available and how how we pick a particular device over another? So, you know, there are three devices on the market. The, uh, the company that's been on the market for the longest is Medtronic. Um, and then there's uh, the next company to be on the market was Abbott. Uh, I should say in the United States was Abbott. Um, and then the final uh, company is Boston Scientific. All three companies now have what we call um, directional leads, which means that you can point the electricity in one direction or another. All three companies have what we call current controlled uh, or current based programming. So looking at amps instead of volts, um, the devices themselves are all a little bit different. Um, you know, the interface for the patients are a little bit different. Uh, the way that programming is done is a little bit different. Some of the systems, um, or one, one of the systems supports you know, remote programming. So patients who uh, aren't close, that can't come in often for programming, that might be preferable for them. Uh, one of the systems has you know, probably a, a better rechargeable system uh, than the other, which is an advantage. Um, and then one of the systems has a sensing, uh, which means it can actually not just stimulate the brain, but it can you know, sense what's going on in the brain and, and hopefully help programming, although that's still under investigation. So each of them has slightly different uh, advantages. I think they're all great. Uh, and so it's a combination of, you know, individual needs. Uh, and sometimes patients come in with a preference and, you know, we work with those preferences. And if we have a strong feeling one way or another, we, we might steer you one way or one direction or another. Otherwise, uh, we'll try and honor a, a preference as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to just add one word about, uh, you know, caution when it comes to getting MRIs, because, you know, once patients are implanted, we always let them know that they have to let us know if they are going to get uh, an MRI and we refer for them to really almost get the MRI at our facility because there's a lot of due diligence that goes into looking at, you know, uh, making sure that the wires are really good. There is nothing uh, wrong with, with the wires and not broken, you know, before we do brain MRI. So definitely if you're going to get a MRI of any body part or of the brain, you really do need to talk to the programming neurologist. Um, Absolutely. And then um, how much post-operative management really, like once you're done with the implant, what's your role in post-operative management of these devices? So, you know, once we finish the implants, uh, the surgical process is, is basically done. We do want to check the wounds and make sure that everything looks okay. Um, we often do that in collaboration with neurology. Um, but then the programming is what starts and, I think it's an ongoing debate whether the surgery is harder or the programming is harder, but they're both critical portions. Um, for me, it's it's not that the surgery, the surgical management continues, but I do love to see and hear about how my patients do. But I, I'm often not directly involved in the in the care of the patients uh, after the implant. Yeah, um, and then how long do the effects of PBS uh, you expect for them to last uh, and for the patient to continue to get improvement? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question uh, because, you know, we have patients, as you know, who were implanted 10 or 15 years ago and still come in for battery changes, which means they still, it's not that they're as good as they were 10 or 15 years ago, their disease has progressed, but they can definitely tell when their generator is starting to run low or when their battery is off. And so they still have that therapeutic benefit. And it's a, the, some of those are interesting cases because now they've developed some cognitive deficits and they wouldn't be people that we would normally implant if they came in anew. Uh, but I, I have definitely seen patients with continued benefit from stimulation for over 10 years, uh, despite disease progression. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, now that we have other advanced therapies such as the duopa, uh, you know, liver dopa, carbidopine, intestinal gel pump, that we've been able to combine both DDS and after many, many years, like, you know, consider duopa, especially if they are not getting good on time. But I think this kinesia has always been able to manage pretty well with DDS, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and so, um, am I really, my last question, and I'm gonna uh, look at the questions from the patients is, 
Are there any other surgical alternatives to DBS therapy? And when would you consider them? So there are, um, you know, as I start, you know, deep brain stimulation emerged out of the area of uh, lesioning the brain. And we can still lesion the brain. We can still do a pallidotomy, although it's rarely done anymore. We can do a thalamotomy also, which is to burn a part of the brain uh, with you know putting a probe in it and burning the thalamus, which helps the tremor. The most recent um, FDA approval actually came for something called focused ultrasound, um, which is a uh, incisionless technique. You still put a frame on and you focus all this ultrasound energy through the skull to increase the temperature in the thalamus and create a lesion in the thalamus. And that will help people with tremor dominant Parkinson's disease, they can help their tremor. Um, and uh, so that is an, an another alternative that can be considered, but we should recognize that it doesn't help the other symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So um, it doesn't help the rigidity or the bradykinesia or definitely the non-motor symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much, Dr. Baradian. And I'm gonna now um, look at the questions that are from uh, the patients. One of the questions is, to what extent is age a factor in determining eligibility for DBS? So I, I hope I, I made that clear. I, you know, age itself is not a factor. Um, I have implanted young onset PD patients. I've also implanted PD patients in their early 80s. Um, I haven't really gone beyond early 80s, but not because of the age. It's usually because of the symptoms that develop. Uh, so I, I, you know, I can see a 65-year-old patient who, you know, has cognitive impairments, and I'm not going to implant. Um, and I could see an 80-year-old patient who's sharp, and you know, it is the motor symptoms that are the disabling symptoms, and I'll implant them. So it's a, it's not chronological age; it's more of the the symptoms. What is your oldest uh, patient? So not with Parkinson's disease. My oldest patient I've implanted with a uh, deep brain stimulator was 91 with essential trauma. Oh, wow. You beat me. Uh, Mine was 87. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that was, you know, a very, not Parkinson's disease, very sharp patient who really wanted tremor control. So um, that it's unusual. I wouldn't say that's common, but it can be done. Yeah, absolutely. And someone wanted to know that if they had both Parkinson's and essential tremor, would, would you consider implanting them? Absolutely. So, you know, Parkinson's disease and essential tremor, you know, they're both common enough that you can get both diagnoses uh, and they can run in families that way. Uh, but yes, the, the, it just, again, it depends on what your symptoms are, what your goals of treatment are, but one does not preclude the other. Uh, so having both diagnoses doesn't preclude you from stimulation. And have you used uh, two different targets, uh, like two different leads and two different targets? I, I've definitely done that in some patients, but I can't remember if it was a PDET patient, uh, but we can. Sometimes, you know, in depending on patient symptoms, sometimes we'll put two sets of electrodes on each side of the brain in order to achieve the symptomatic goals of our intervention. Uh, it can be, we, sometimes it, you have to be creative. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, this is a question that I think you have answered, but I'll still kind of, uh, so somebody wants to know if I'm a good candidate for DBS now, and I decide to wait, what's the likelihood I'll still be a good candidate in six months or a year? And are there any factors that would make me a bad candidate in the future? Um, so hopefully, uh, yeah, this was early on in the presentation. Hopefully there's a better feeling for this, but I'll try and answer it briefly. Essentially, you know, I, I think six months rarely significantly changes someone um, or a year. Unless, you know, once someone starts developing some cognitive impairments related to Parkinson's disease, especially in the memory domain, it, it could progress somewhat uh, quickly. Um, but in general, if you're a candidate now, you'll be, probably be a candidate in six months or a year. Uh, but I always, you know, if someone hasn't, I haven't seen someone in a year, if I see someone today and I recommend surgery and they call me in a year from now, I'm going to want to see them again. And I'm going to want to talk about their symptoms and, and how they're different or how they're the same. It's not a foregone conclusion that I automatically implant you, but I think in most cases they do. And, and the biggest uh, the factors that would preclude future candidacy, again, the cognitive issues. And then if you start developing, this is something we haven't talked about, so it's important. Um, freezing of gait um, is a symptom that 
Um, if it's not responsive to medications or you develop dominant gait symptoms that are disabling, that also gives us pause and, and may change the course of our recommendation. Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, some are saying to get DVS sooner because it halts GD progression. Is this backed by science uh, and evidence? So there's only one study of I, that I know of that suggests that there's any modification of disease related to deep brain stimulation for PD, and that was in the early stimulation study out of Vanderbilt saying that the progression of tremor may change. Uh, but that was that study wasn't designed to evaluate that, and it's you know it's question it's it's not as clean as you want it to be. I think in general we do not believe deep brain stimulation to be disease modifying. Um, I think, and Dr. Chitnis can correct me, one of the only things we know that modifies disease and Parkinson's disease is exercise. And so that's the uh, primary thing that we would say is disease modifying. Yes, absolutely. Um, did you say non-responders to carbidopa, levodopa are not candidates for DBS? I think you guys. So the, yeah. the short answer is, he, correct. If you, if you don't respond to carbidopa, levodopa, you're probably not a candidate for deep brain stimulation unless uh, you're, you're a non-responder because you're a tremor dominant patient who's not responding to carbidopa, levodopa. So there's that uh, subgroup of patients with tremor that don't respond to carbidopa, levodopa. They actually do respond. If you look at their rigidity or bradykinesia, they probably do get better, but their tremor doesn't get better. And those people we do consider deep brain stimulation. But if you don't have tremor and your rigidity and your slowness don't get better, then we really do need to look at it more closely. Maybe you're not getting enough dose, or maybe there's something else going on. That's when I really lean on Dr. Chitness or other movement disorders neurologists to say, what is going on? Why are we not seeing a response? It, it gives us pause and really needs us needs for us to look deep, more deeply. Yeah, and so if in, I can add to that, really one of the things that I always start to investigate is are you taking, you know, is it that you are not taking your medicines the right way, you're constipated, or is it that your disease is such that it will not respond to levodopa, carbidopa? Another point I'll add is we, we've seen this a little bit more. You know, uh, when I was in training, they used to say that if you have uh, slowly increased the dose of the medication up to 8,000 milligrams, that's a gram of levodopa, and the patient has not responded, then you would say that they're not responding. But you know, we learned more, and I think Alberto Espe has done a little work with this, where he says that there is a category of patients that require a even higher dose to be able to get the response. So the the you know the kind of the message for us is to maybe even try to go beyond that thousand milligrams as long as the patient is able to tolerate and see. And there's some patients that maybe respond at 1500 uh, milligrams and then those people could be a candidate. Um, but, you know, um, and then, let me see. Does DBS work well for PSP patients? No, <laughs> is the one word answer. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, just it's the patients that, uh, you know, uh, BBS is approved for uh, levodopa responsive, uh, idiopathic Parkinson's disease would be one exception of the tremor predominant disease, you know, per se, and the atypical forms, uh, it's not approved and they don't respond. So the, the, the only surgery I've ever done for someone with PSB was someone with significant uh, hypertonia and, you know, rigidity, and we did a baclofen pump which was palliative, uh, but that was the only time I've ever done a surgery for PSP. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, somebody wanted to know what is involved uh, with the gel pump, and I'm happy to answer that. Yes, please, because I don't do to. the gel pumps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, you know, levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal gel pump, this is, you know, it's, it's really levodopa, carbidopa. It's just a formulation. It's in the form of a gel. And what happens is there is a cassette and that cassette is basically connected to a pump. And there's a long process that is involved. What we do is we look at the total cumulative dose of levodopa, carbidopa that you are taking. And then we figure out what would, how many, uh, you know, literally milligrams per hour, you know, in the form of milliliters, because that's in the form of milliliter, we figure it out. 
The other processes involves a gastroenterologist that will basically do an endoscopy and will create a hole that's called a peg, uh, you know, um, tube or a hole in the stomach. And then there is another tube that's called the J tube. So it's called a peg J tube. And that goes into the part of the intestine that's called the jejunum, where levodopa, carbidopa is absorbed. So once we figure out what is the total amount of levodopa, carbidopa that you are taking orally, then we convert it into the, the gel dose. And then uh, we will um, literally admit the patient, put a you know, um, NG tube, that's a nasogastric tube, and then we'll experiment and titrate and see how much we need to give per hour. And then once we figured that out, then we program that into the pump, which is then you know, connected through the PET tube. And really the patient then at that point uh, almost takes no oral levodopa, carbidopa. Uh, usually it is recommended to try the pump for about 16 hours, but then and, and in, the, in the remaining time, sometimes the patient can take an extended release form of levodopa, carbidopa to help them through the night. But there are some patients you know, who really fluctuate in those, in that case, we can also run it for about 24 hours. So it's a whole uh, evaluation process. And, and some people resort to do just the Duopa pump instead of doing DDS. So that's uh, certainly an option, especially the people who are you know, more wearing off more, uh, we do the, the pump more as opposed to people that are wearing off and dyskinesias, you know, DDS is probably you know, definitely better for that. You know, your, your comment made me think of something else that I think is, is really important that didn't come across yet, which is the stimulation is not a replacement for medications. Um, and people should expect after surgery, in most cases, to continue to take medications. It works in concert with the medications. Uh, so to you know, decrease those peak dose dyskinesias or dystonias, as well as those off times and, and blunt the off times. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's not a replacement. It's just like over the years, you've added medications or changed the schedule of medications. We're adding another treatment, which happens to be deep brain stimulation, and it may result in adjustments of your medications, uh, but it's not a replacement. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, these are two of my questions out of interest. Uh, one is that you know there's at least been uh, a lot of attempts to try to use the target, which is the PPN or the peduncular pontine nucleus, to basically address you know freezing of gait and gait dysfunction in Parkinson's. Uh, so your comments on that? Right. So the um, what we've been talking about mostly this evening is uh, deep brain stimulation targeting either the subthalamic nucleus or the globus pallidus, which are the two most common targets that we use. There's another target, as you said, the PPN, uh, which probably about 10 or 12 years ago, there was an immense amount of interest um, in terms of uh, its role in uh, controlling um, or modifying freezing of gait. As I mentioned, deep brain stimulation doesn't help freezing of gait, especially those that are not dopamine responsive. And so that's why people started exploring the PPN as a stimulation target. A lot of those studies were inconsistent. And in fact, uh, there's a study that came out of Toronto that basically said just placing the electrode, people with the electrode did better than people without the electrode, but it didn't matter whether or not it was on or off, which makes you wonder what the stimulation was actually doing. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think the jury's out there. There's still people doing research on this. Part of the problem is you know, location is everything, and it's not quite clear exactly where that target is. And so there, there may be some hope. I think it's worth exploring further, but it's not something we do routinely at this point. And just as a follow-up to that, uh, what about uh, spinal cord stimulation for freezing of gait? Yeah, so there's been a lot of interest in spinal cord stimulation for, for gait dysfunction in patients with Parkinson's disease. I honestly don't know what to think of that. I think uh, all those studies have been uh, non-blinded, which means people know what's that the stimulator is on and they haven't had uh, fantastic controls. I think it's some pretty compelling data and I know there's still some ongoing studies looking at that. Most of those studies have also been um, opportunistic, which means people who happen to have pain and happen to have Parkinson's disease and looking at the effect on gait. 
So I, I think there, I know there are ongoing studies evaluating that and I think it's worth it, but I wouldn't implant someone primarily for gait dysfunction at this point based on the available data. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And I wanna just, uh, so somebody wanted to know that we started talking about the new program that we are running at UT Southwest and then we stopped. So I'll just, uh, I'll say something and I'll let Dr. Paratian add on. So previously before Dr. Paratian came here, the way we used to approach patients is that we got referrals from the community neurologist or within our section itself. And we really went through a early process of you know, pre-evaluation where the patients came in off medication. We did an off and on exam. We did a lot of gait lab testing. We did you know, uh, various scales. We did some questionnaires uh, you know, where we looked at um, you know, quality of life and, and mood. And uh, the thing is that this process not only is you know, a relatively long process, but it takes a really long time before the patient can actually see either the neurologist who's going to be doing the programming and the neurosurgeon who's going to be doing their implantation. And so you know, where I trained and where Dr. Puratian came from, uh, you know, and Dr. Puratian really wants to develop a patient-centric you know, uh, head-on approach. And because of that, we have now developed uh, a, you know, this is a process in evolution and a neuromodulation dual clinic. So Nader, I'll let you pick up from there. Yeah, and so I, I mentioned this uh, a bit. Um, it is, the idea is that we communicate better as with our voices than we do through paper. Uh, and the idea is for us to be there and to evaluate patients together and to actively uh, collaborate and brainstorm and, and share what our concerns are, share where, where we think the opportunities are for each patient and to you know, decide together you know, what um, the next steps should be and what the recommendations should be. And I have found in my experience, one, I think it delivers better care. There's less lost in translation um, and it's, you know, patients tend to like it as well because they come to one place and you've got all the doctors coming around you and talking to you and answering your questions from the different perspectives. Because when people ask me questions about neurology or that are neurologically based, I immediately turn to Dr. Chitness. And if they ask a surgical question, they then I'm there to answer them. The other thing that's really useful is it's confusing for patients after you get implanted because sometimes people will say, well, I don't know who to call. And having this integrated program is helpful because it doesn't matter who you call. You can call my office and if you need Dr. Fitness, we'll, take, we'll get you there. And if it happens to be a surgical question, then her office will get you to me um, without you having, you know, I, I think um, the onus should not be on you to figure out the medical system. The onus should be on us to provide the care for you. And so that's what we do by having this integrated clinic. Yes, thank you. And somebody just asked the last question. Uh, are you familiar with the robotic assisted DBS done by Dr. David Wensico in Littleton, Colorado? Uh, I would think with the precision this procedure allows the surgeon to perform, why wouldn't there be more neurosurgeons being trained in this technique? Um, so a uh, couple things. One is we have the robot. We can do the robotic technique. Um, the robotic technique still requires the frame placement. Um, and the robot is actually really useful for a different type of surgery, for epilepsy surgery, where you're putting multiple electrodes in. Um, there's no data to support uh, that, especially for deep brain stimulation, that robot-assisted implantation is any more precise or more accurate than uh, the way that we've done it. In fact, my experience is that the robot is, for this type of surgery, is less precise uh, than uh, doing it with a stereotypic frame. It sounds like it's better, that it's robot assisted, uh, but it takes, uh, it's not faster. And, you know, I'll give it, it might be just as precise, but it's definitely not more precise than uh, the way that we've done it historically. So it's, uh, I don't think it's wrong to do it that way. I don't think there's a particular advantage. And I would think if you spoke to a, a bunch of neurosurgical experts who do this, uh, they probably agree with me. And you know, I guess to speak to that, I can do it with a robot, and I don't do it with a robot. Um, but there are people who do it. You know, my good friend, uh, Dr. Sheth, who's at uh, Baylor in Houston, uh, uses the robot, um, and I know other people who do. It's, I think it's more of a 
I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to answer it, except that every surgeon has their preferred way. I, there's no data whatsoever to support it's more accurate. In fact, across all the techniques, there's no single technique that has been shown to be more accurate and more precise. Yes, thank you so much. And with that, Shelly, Dr. Paratian, thanks so much. And over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Parati, and thank you, Dr. Shitness, for conducting such an excellent interview. And thank you, everyone, for joining. I think we got all of our questions answered. If you benefited from tonight's session or any of our other webinars, let us know. You can reach out to us at info at skypassfoundation.org. We would love to hear from you. In addition to that, if you're a person with Parkinson's or a care partner and you have an unmet need, we would love to hear from you on that as well. We exist to meet those needs, our mission is to serve the Parkinson's community and as much information as you guys can give us in order to help us do our jobs is very, very helpful, very beneficial. So we love hearing from you. Keep the conversation going with us at info at skypassfoundation.org. And lastly, registration for our October Ask the Doctor webinar will be open later this week by this Friday. So we will keep you posted on that. I'll be sending out an email with some information on that. And with that, we will call it a night. Thank you again, Dr. Paratin. It was a pleasure to meet you. And thank you, Dr. Chitness. Take care, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you. Have a good Take night. Care.